Well, thank you all for coming out this evening. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25. Yes, I will. I'll give you page number. That is num page number 143. This will be our opening passage for this evening. Exodus 25. Let's read verses 1 to 9, starting at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onk stones, and stones to be set uh, in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now, I want to zone in on a particular phrase here in verse number 6 for anointing oil. Verse 6, I want to teach and mainly just do a teaching tonight on anointing oil. So you could thank Frank for this study because he asked me a good, good question Sunday morning, which was along the lines of, what does it mean to be anointed? Are Christians anointed? And pretty much, what's the deal with this oil here? All right, so... We'll have ourselves a Bible study tonight, and we will hopefully find the answer to those questions. So number one, go to 2 Timothy 2.15. You probably should memorize it. You know it. But as in all Bible studies, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 plays a crucial role because that verse says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. So after all, you can't study the Bible without this role. You cannot study the Bible and say, I'm going to have a Bible study without that role that says rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a must. Now, um, that's what we have to do in any biblical topic that we seek to understand is that first off, we've got to rightly divide the word of truth as we study for the answer. Now, all the Bible is written for us. It's for us, for our learning, for admonition, for examples. Paul says that's for us. But not all the Bible is written to us directly. Um, that's, that's, just, that's just how it goes, and that's a, that's a law of biblical interpretation. Now, there are um, three groups of people, 1 Corinthians chapter 10.32, 1 Corinthians 10.32, three groups of people in the whole entire world, and the Apostle Paul defines them for you in 1 Corinthians 10.32, Paul writes this, he says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, there's one, nor to the Gentiles, that's another one, nor to the church of God. And in verse 33 he says this, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but it's interesting how it says, even as I please all men. What, what does all men consist of? All men are either a Jew, a Gentile, or they are a part of the church of God. If you are not a Jew... You are a Gentile. So just to, to get this to stick in your heads, what, what are some nationalities in here? Yell them out. What, what are you guys? Italian. Italian? All right, amen. you got to get the top spot. Irish? Or Irish are fighting. All right, we've got some Irish. German. 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 Scottish. Scottish. Any, anybody else? Hungarian. Hungarian Slovak. French. French. English. English. All right, well, you get the idea, okay? If any other nationality, I think there's two, over 250-some different nations, nationalities. It don't matter. You're, you're what's labeled as a Gentile according to the Word of God, okay? A Jew, a Gentile, or the Church of God. Now, here's how this works. When you got saved, when you put your faith and trust in the finished works of the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, you're counting on that to get you to heaven, you got baptized into a spiritual body, which is the body of Jesus Christ. Come to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. Galatians, chapter 3. Some of this stuff may be a recap. 
I mean, you know, and some of the stuff just may be just a just a good old Bible study, you know, type of topic. But uh, whether they're they're worthy to go go over again and again and again. Galatians chapter three, verse number twenty six. That's page number fifteen forty nine. Galatians three twenty six fifteen forty nine. And it says this, For ye are all children of God, period. Does it say that? No, it, it does not stop there. So beware of anybody that walks up to you and says, Hey, we're all, we're, we're all just a bunch of children of God. We're all, you know, Pope will come up and give a little speech and say, We're all God's children. And No, it's very clear. Look what it says, Galatians 3.26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, by faith. If you don't have faith in Christ Jesus, you're not a child of his, actually. You may be, you know, an offspring of God in a sense. You know, Paul, Paul says that in the book of, uh, of Acts. But you're not, you're not a, an intimate child of his, okay, um, according to that statement there. Now, look at, verse number, uh, look at verse number 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now, it's a blessing. We'll, we will be uh, having a baptism. A April wants to get baptized. Um, well, I might as well make, make the announcement now. Uh, Lori, if your swimming pool, Phil, if your swimming pool is open, because uh, the, the, the river is looking pretty low. That's what my dad said. So we got, I don't know, about like a foot and a half of water, and we're not getting no rain. So where John Paul got baptized, you know, we found a nice little hole right there, but um, keep keep that in mind if if we can use your guys' pull for that. But that'll be I'll make the announcement this Sunday, and then we'll go from there. Have it next uh, next Sunday, two weeks. So as of many as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now uh, this baptism, believe it or not, it has nothing to do with water. What we just read it has nothing to do with water. Water baptism, which is physical, it's a physical act. It cannot put you into the body of Christ, which is spiritual. Something physical cannot put you into something spiritual. Okay, so the context of this, you know, as, as I've been baptized into Christ, you read it for what it says, and what it says, you're baptized into Christ, not water. This is a spirit baptism. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just quote you 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we, we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. That's clearly a spiritual thing. I mean, he says it, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. He don't say by one certain preacher are you all baptized into the water. There's actually seven different kinds of baptisms in the Bible. And this is a spiritual baptism here. So Galatians 3, 27, Galatians 3, 27, uh, there is neither, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, baptize into Christ. The spiritual puts you into the spiritual, all right? And how do we know that this is a, a spiritual baptism? Because the next verse is clearly spiritual, all right? There's neither Jew nor Greek. So think about that statement. Paul goes around in the book of Romans and says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first, then to the Greek. Well, he, he tells you a difference right there, to the Jew first, then to the Greek. So what's he talking about in Galatians 3.28? It's clearly a spiritual context. Is there any physical difference between a, a Jew and a Gentile? So there sure is. They have different diets. They have different culture, different locations, different languages, you know, customs, all that stuff. So is, uh, is there, a, now I'll ask you this question. Is there a spiritual difference between a Jew, raised a Jew, born a Jew, who puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and gets saved, versus a Gentile that puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and gets saved. Is there a spiritual difference? There's not. He says we're all one in Christ Jesus. Look at the next part. Bond nor free. Same principle. Is there a difference between somebody who is in jail and somebody who is out of jail? 
Yeah, clearly. Okay. Now, uh, one's chained up, the other man's free. Is there a spiritual difference between that man that's behind the jail cell that just got on his knee and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ versus somebody that is, is a free man, is, is not in jail? Is there a spiritual difference? No. It, you're, you're all one. Well, look at, look at the next part. Neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Now, let me ask you this question. This might, be a, this might be a tough one, but is there a difference between a male and a female? Well, yeah, of course. You know, if, 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 you, know you may identify as non-binary, but that doesn't matter because we, we, we go by our definitions according to what God says. In the beginning, made them male and female. So, you know, but when, you, when a male or a female gets saved, spiritually speaking, their gender does not matter. It's, 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 uh, when, you're, when you're in Christ... Your gender doesn't matter. Your nationality doesn't matter. Your color doesn't matter. Your uh, circumstance in life, whatever you're in, doesn't matter. The place where you got saved doesn't matter. There's pure spiritual equality when you're in the body of Christ. And the, but Paul says it's a great mystery. We are in the spiritual body of God, the body of Christ. But you do not lose those physical distinctions, obviously. Okay, I've heard liberal preachers actually try to use that verse that we just read to try to justify transgenderism and stuff. That's, that's wild, okay? You know, when you get saved, you don't bust out of jail and you're a free man. You know, when you get, when you get saved as a man, that don't give you the pass to use the woman's restroom and vice, vice versa. Okay, so clearly, you, the point is you've got to do some rightly dividing in God's word. You got, and what we're doing here is we're rightly dividing the difference between spiritual and physical. You got to do that. So back to our opening passage in Exodus. Exodus chapter 25. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about the anointing. Exodus 25, verse number 1. Let's just go through this passage real quick. Exodus 25, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Now, who is Moses? He's a Hebrew. He's a, he was a Jew. Okay, now, I'm going to get, get this now. Because there's certain terminology you got to be familiar with in the Bible. A Hebrew is also a Jew who is also an Israelite who also has a particular tribe associated with them. Okay, now, how do you know that a Hebrew is a Jew? Well, we cross-reference that and we go to the writings of the Apostle Paul and Acts chapter 23, verse 3, Paul says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, okay, born in Tarsus. He says, I, you know, he is a Jew. And then in Philippians, he says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. He says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul's a Hebrew. And then 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two, he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. He's a Jew. He's a Hebrew. He's an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, that's you just gotta you gotta just gotta get that down. Okay, take take a little time, but it's all right. So um, Exodus twenty five verse one, the Lord spake unto Moses. All right, a Jew, Hebrew. Speak unto the children of Israel. Are you a child of Israel? No, we are part of the body of Christ. You are not a child of Israel. Okay, we just went through that in Galatians. Now this is this is a good verse here though. Verse number two. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. Now look, just because this verse isn't written directly to us, to the church, to the body of Christ, to the Christian, it doesn't mean that we can't get any learning from this verse. There's always a, always a great spiritual underlayment in every verse of the Bible. Okay, But look, you, you want to read into the spiritual underlayment last you, you don't want to you don't want to over spiritualize literal stories in the bible for example you know david versus goliath you don't want to over spiritualize that and just say david he, he just overcame a serious obstacle in his life you know some trouble or he, it wasn't a serious this the serious obstacle was a was a uh, six cubit in a span. The Bible tells you how tall Goliath was. Nine foot nine. Six cubits in a span. So uh, it was, it was a he fought a literal giant. Okay? But on the other hand, you don't want to quench a spiritual lesson that can be found with David fighting Goliath. Um, you know, a, a spiritual lesson that can be found within a historical story. You don't want to 
uh, there's always spiritual learning that we can get from that. So this one in particular in Exodus, uh, here's the spiritual picture. Moses is a, is a type of or a picture or a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and um, what offering, notice this, speaking of that they bring me an offering. Well, what offering are we supposed to bring to God today? Romans chapter 12, that we present our, our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, unblameable unto God, and offer up thanksgiving and offer up, you know, the sacrifice of praise to God. We make spiritual sacrifices, and those are considered offerings in the New Testament. So, uh, you know, how, how, how do we give that offering to God? Do we do it by force? Can I, can I force you to want to serve God? No. Can anybody in your family or anybody in your church or whatever, can, can they force you to serve God? Nobody can. So how do we offer up this offering? That they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. So you see that. You got to give it willingly. So a man has free will. Unlike a Calvinist would, would teach. You see how much learning, how much you can go through just one verse of scripture? You know, I, and I know, I, I, I we're, we should, you know, attend, oh, let's spend five weeks on this scripture now. But th it's just tough. There's so much learning that we can, that we can get in the word of God, the bread of life. But moving on, um, if you offer your body a living sacrifice to God willingly, you are worshiping God. You are serving God. That's how you serve God, by offering your body a living sacrifice to him. Okay, and he'll accept it. Now, you say, well, you know, what's all this got to do with anointing and oil? Well, it has a lot. Because if you don't understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, if you don't understand how to rightly divide the, uh, the different groups of people and the spiritual types and pictures, and you, then you're not going to understand what is the significance of this anointing? What's the significance of oil in the Bible? Uh, we'll, so we're going we're gonna to get to that. Now, look at verse 3. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. Now, right away, all this stuff, this is of high value. Gold, silver, and brass. I mean, it's kind of like going down the, the, the list of things, uh, you know, from top to bottom. Uh, gold is, is, is of value. So this right here, what we're reading here is the formation of a religion. God only ordained one true religion. That's Judaism. And it's the formation of Judaism. When they, when they left Egypt... The Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. All right, and you can look at Exodus chapter 3 real quick. If you remember this in your Exodus reading. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 21. It says this. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that uh, sojourneth in her house Jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. There goes your blues and purples and scarlets and all that. And ye shall put them on your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. What we read right there is God just granted these Jews that were enslaved for 430 years. He just granted them divine favor and said, you know, when, you know these citizens, they knew they were bond slaves, and, and they knew they were getting ready to be freed from, from Egypt. They, they gave them their wealth for their, for their journey. This, this spoiling wasn't, wasn't robbing them, as your Bible critics would love to say. Oh, look at, you know, look at God. He just told them to you know, rob, their, rob their people's houses. It, it was willingly. He walked in, and they told him what happened. And they, here, here, here you go. Take some of my gold. Take some of my clothes. Take some of my silver. And go on. The Jews didn't rob the Egyptians and nothing like that. Consider it this. Consider it compensation for 430 years of slavery. <laughs> it is the least we can do. We'll give you some of our, our gold and some things of high value. You know, go on you know, with, with, with your journey. Okay, that's, that's, that, that the point is that's where they got all their wealth from in the wilderness. These, uh, and all this stuff were uh, used to construct the tabernacle. All that stuff they got from Egypt. So what's that kind of tell me is God's able to transform the things of the world into something that'll bring him glory. He took all, you know, he's, God's real picky with certain things. Don't take the horses from Egypt. We don't want nothing to do with that, but the gold, the silver, all this stuff, take that stuff from Egypt and build me something I can dwell in with you. Build me a tabernacle. And uh, 
you know, you, you got to use the things of the world and, and give them to God. Give them to God. You know, you, Paul says this, using the world as though not abusing it for the fashion of the world passeth, passeth away. So you, you got, if you've got opportunities in your life, use them for God. If you've got certain talents in your life, use them for God. If you've got certain positions that, that, that you're in, use them for God. If you have nice things, give God the glory for, for giving them to you. Just pay attention. The Bible says take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. That's Luke 12, 15. So Exodus 25, 3, it says, this is the offering, gold, okay, silver, you know, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins, badger skins, shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, sweet incense. Uh, verse 9, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, in the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so you make it. So you think about that. God gave Moses the pattern, the blueprint, on how to build this sanctuary and what they needed to give up in order for God to dwell among them. What they needed to give up. Well, so how about you? What, what do you need to give up in order to have a relationship, a better relationship with God? You know, I know this is, old, this is speaking of the Old Testament. And thank God, God, number one, there is no physical temple these days as a brick and mortar type building but what's the temple today our bodies our bodies are are the temple when you know what's what's what are you holding on to that's hindering your relationship with god it could, could it be all those things your gold your silver your brass all that give give them to god give god the glory give them over to the lord now we have a real advantage over them here's our advantage god dwells with us 24 7 he don't come and go he dwells with his with a child of God by faith in Christ 24/7. Now it's up to you whether you want to, you know, have sweet fellowship with him, talk talk to him and commune with him and think about him and things like that. But here's where we have a disadvantage. When God accepted their worship service, he came down in a pillar of fire and literally filled up the building. <laughs> filled up the place. I mean, that's that's a, that's an advantage, you know. You imagine that or you know, imagine if you're in fellowship with the Lord at, in your prayer closet or wherever you do, you know, your communion with God. Next, you know, God shows up in a pillar of fire. Bang. He just shows up right there. That's, that, you know, that's how we know that guy's in fellowship because there's a pillar of fire following him around all day long. It doesn't work like that, though, anymore. Okay, now, God did that to show them that, you know, he accepted what he told them to do. And that's, a, that's quite the picture, man. I, I, I just can't think about it. God, man, he, he's out in eternity. He parts the space and bang, a, a fire just lighting up the temple. But probably could be seen from miles and miles away. There's those Jews over there, and look at their, look at their God. He just, a, a beam of fire is upon their camp. That's a blessing. Uh, but look at verse number um, 20, uh, verse number 6, anointing oil, okay? Now, this is the first mention of this word, and it shows us how this word, word will be used throughout the Scripture. Now, this oil isn't something to be paired with red wine vinegar and poured on your salad. It's, it's not that kind of oil. This is, a, this is for a specific purpose, anointing. What's that mean? That means to smear, to put on, uh, you know, Jesus Christ. He, he anointed the, blinds man, the blind man's eyes with clay. Made a little spittle, made some clay, put, put it on that man's eyes. He anointed the man's eyes, all right? Now, look at Exodus 20, uh, 37. Exodus 37, verse 29. Exodus 37, 29. There's a specific recipe for this oil given by God. Exodus 37, 29. And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices according to the uh, apothecary, apothecary. Uh, I guess that's like, that's like a guy that, that, you know, mixes up the herbs and, you know, things like that. I don't got a definition of apo apothecary, but that's his job, all right? Uh, the, now notice, holy anointing oil. Come to the same book. I'm having you flip a little bit, but look to Exodus chapter 30. If you were just in 37, a couple chapters to the left. 
Exodus 30. All right, Exodus 30, verse number 22. This is the anointing oil. And here, here's the recipe for this thing. Exodus 30, 22, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee three, or take unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels. That's $135 I got in my margin. $135 of myrrh. Uh, myrrh, 500 shekels. And of sweet cinnamon, half so much. Half of that, I got written down about $67 or $60, $60, of cinnamon oil. Even 250 shekels. Uh, okay, 250 shekels. Yeah, $167. Yeah, and of sweet calamus. Uh, calamus, 250 shekels, $67. And of cassia, 500, uh, 500 shekels, 135 bucks. After the shekel of, a sanctu of the sanctuary, and, a, and, an, uh, and of oil, olive, a hen. I guess it's just to dilute. This would be in your, <laughs> this would be in your, uh, your carry oil, I guess. You dilute the thing. Verse 25, And thou shalt make it an, an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. Um, there's my definition. A person who prepared and sold medicines. There's, there it is. It shall be a holy anointing oil. 450, 404 U.S. dollars today. You can get your, your, your anointing oil. 404 dollars. And that's not including inflation, so jack that up maybe times three. $1,500 anointing oil. Look at verse 26. And thou shalt anoint... The tabernacle of the congregation. I don't know. I got notes on on myrrh, cinnamon, calamus, cassia, all the medicinal properties, and there's a reason why he picked all those. We're not going to get into that though. But 26, thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation in the ark of the testimony. That anoint every every single thing in it. Number one, I got to smell real good, and there's a lot of antiseptic, antibacterial fighting things, and and you know help your help your help you stay focused and stuff like that, and like a you know, imagine putting a smelling salt on you like, all right, I'm, a, I'm awake now. I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm serious. I could focus and stuff. There's, so the thing had to smell wonderful, okay? Now, where, where's that verse that says, look at verse number 31. And it talks about anointing Aaron, his sons, you know, rubbing on them and stuff like that. And this is most holy, okay? But look at verse 31. And thus, before, before you think, oh, man, I'm going to go out and on Amazon and I'm going to buy me all these spices. I'm going to mix them up and I'm going to start doing this to my house. Before you think like that, look at verse 31. Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Israel's generations, not ours. Look at this. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall ye, neither shall ye make any other like it after the composition of it it is holy it shall be holy unto you whosoever compoundeth any like it or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger even shall even be cut off from his people get out of my camp you don't belong here you're not one of us anymore because you messed around and made some oil you were told not to make not to make that's pretty serious that's a law uh, that's a law in exodus one of the 612 laws in in the book of exodus okay so this oil was used in the service of worship under the Levitical priesthood. It was used upon the priests. It was used upon the things in the tabernacle. Keep that in mind. There's not one reference from the Apostle Paul uh, of, of uh, you know, the writer to the church age epistles about him talking about holy oil, holy water, holy garments, uh, holy place. Paul doesn't say that stuff. If that was so important, so crucial, how come God didn't say, hey, you better make sure you mention this whole, you know, you're going out and establishing churches in Crete and Macedonia and, you know, Turkey and Syria. You better tell them about that holy oil, anointing oil. You better tell these Gentiles that not one mention of those holy things. But there's a particular church out there. How many of you have ever heard of holy water? <laughs> I say, everybody. If you went to a Catholic church, they got the holy water. They got the holy incense. They're hijacking verses that are to Israel and ascribing them to themselves. That's, that's, that's called replacement theology. You can't do that. And you try making anything like that, and I know, the Catholic Church smells good. It smells real good. I'm like, man, 
I, I like this. I can get I can get used to this. You know, got the good good smell and stuff. And they get the you know they got that that certain tone of voice and they got they ring the bells and the chants and you're like, man, I'm really worshiping God right now. This is great. God didn't told you, maybe quoted you two Bible verses the, the whole time. <laughs> but that's you got to be careful. This is the Levitical priesthood. Okay, now. Why do we need these things, you know, these, these, these ritualistic type things? Everything going on in, in the tabernacle in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we need a brazen altar that's burning 24-7? Why do we need to do that if Jesus Christ is our, is our, sacrif our sacrificial lamb? Why do we need a brazen altar? What do we need the laver of water that the, that the priests had to go in and wash their hands and make sure they washed their feet before they stepped into the tabernacle? Why, did they, why do we need that when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin? Why do we need a, why do we need a lamp, the manure? You all seen it. Does, you know, the, 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 what is it? We don't even got one in here. You know what I'm talking about. What's it, seven candlesticks? You know, the Jewish manure. Yeah. Why do we need to put that up in here when Jesus Christ is the light that lighteth all men? I am the light of the world, he says. And another thing, why, you know, why do we need the table of showbread? Nice little table over there. You know, that, you know, why do we need the table of showbread when Jesus Christ is the bread of life? I am the bread that came down from heaven, he says. Why do we need the, the veil that covered the most holy place when Jesus Christ died? The veil was split in two, you know, thus giving us access directly to God. What do we need to have a veil, a big curtain up in here for? We don't need that. Why do we need the Ark of the Covenant? That box, that golden box, had the law, the Aaron's staff, had the, the bowl they caught the manna in. Why do we need the Ark of the Covenant when Jesus Christ is our high priest? He, may, he sprinkled his blood on that Ark of the Covenant. I don't, I don't got to do that. And the Bible says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. I don't, we don't need any of these, these elements in the, in the tabernacle anymore. Christ is the fulfillment of that. So... God told the Jews what to do and how to do things, and he accepted them or cut them off based upon their obedience. Uh, Leviticus 10, verse 6 and 9. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6. Uh, a couple other things about this. Leviticus 10, 6, it says, Moses said unto Aaron, that's his brother, the high priest, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar, his sons, Aaron's sons. He's telling them, Uncover not your heads, Neither rend your clothes. Well, it looked like the high priest is in big, big trouble when he rent his clothes like that. Don't, don't, he said, don't do that. But he did it anyways. Remember when Christ said he's the son of God? Neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But, your, uh, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. All right, amen. Then it goes on, look at verse 9. Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when thou go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. <laughs> go tell that one to a Catholic priest. You know, I'm sure you've seen it before. Everybody drinks wine, and next thing you know, that, that priest, I saw him. I've, and she probably saw him too, Jordan, when we were at, who's, what, whose funeral was that? Oh, no, that was, that was you. We were at Anne Fran's funeral. Oh, no, that was Uncle Dew's funeral. They, everybody did the thing. That priest, he chugged, he chugged the cup. He took it back. I, and, you know, I'm like, look at him. He just, drank, he just took that glass of wine back like nothing. Well, if you want to be the, the, the Jewish priesthood, why are you drinking wine? Lest you die. It shall be a stat. So that, you know, they don't listen to that, but they, they pick and choose a lot of stuff. If you want to be the Levitical priesthood, you better fulfill that thing to a T. Don't just pick and choose. We think, ah, oh, this is all right. No, this is, this is, the law is serious stuff, man. Those that say you want to, they want to live by the law, you, you better live by the law, and you can't. You can't. All right, now, number one, this anointing oil was used by Jewish priests the, in the Levitical priesthood. It was to consecrate, set apart individuals or objects for the service in, in God's tabernacle. So you don't need to go around and pour a bunch of holy oil, you know, all over your house to consecrate your home. You don't need to do that. Your physical home is not the temple. Your body is the temple, not today. So, you know, plus, you've got to remember what God said about trying to reproduce that oil. 
If you try to make it something like that, you were cut off from among your people. So God didn't give you the authority to use that, that stuff. You're not a Levitical priest. If you want to sprinkle oil everywhere around your house, okay, let's take it farther. Let's do all the law. Let, why don't you sprinkle the blood of bulls and goats around your house too? <laughs> you know, uh, no, I'll keep the good stuff that smells good and I'll do that on my house and my furniture. But, but the blood of bulls and goats, that's what they did. And you, could go, you can go read Leviticus 8, verse 23. It talks about Moses, you know. He's, he's taking blood. He's dipping it on the, the tip of the, his, the priest's ear. And, he's, and he dips it and he puts it on his big toe. Imagine if I was standing in the back door. Before you come into this place, I got my pail of blood. Let me see your ear. You, told, you show me your ear. All right. Let me see that big toe. I put it on your toe. Every, I, I've had to do that to every single one that came into the the tabernacle of God. It, you, you can't. <laughs> you can't, okay? Now, there's a lot of kinds of spiritual pictures and stuff like that. We'll, we'll get into that. So number two, come to 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse number 39. Here's the, here's the other use for this anointing oil. 1 Kings 1, 39. You imagine if, just thinking about that, you know, wife just cleaned the house and, you know, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go in the backyard. I'm gonna kill some chickens, and I'm just I'm sprinkling blood all over my furniture now. You'd think something was <laughs> to try to ward away unclean spirits and stuff. You'd think something was wrong with me. You you'd better ward me away if if I was to ever start doing something like that. So it's 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 not to us. Look at First Kings chapter one. Look at verse number thirty nine. First Kings one thirty nine. It, it's a guy named Zadok. Z Zadok, Zadok, Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet and the people said, God save King Solomon. So that, the priest anoints Solomon as king. All right, same book, 1 Kings. Could, can you guess what the book of 1 Kings is about? <laughs> it's about kings also. What, what happens with these kings? Well, uh, Let's see, uh, Kings 19.16, 19.16, um, even verse number 15. Now Elijah, Elijah the prophet, he was instructed to anoint two kings. Uh, verse 15, the Lord said unto him, Go, return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. Interesting, another, not even a Jewish nation, but over king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahalah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Elijah anointed two kings, and his, his main sidekick, his, his accomplice, his, what do they call him, his, uh, his protege, I guess, the guy was his successor or whatever, anoint prophet Elisha. All right, so there's three anointings right there that was done by Elijah the prophet. So not only were priests commanded to anoint, some of the prophets were commanded uh, to anoint. Samuel, all right, Samuel was a great prophet. He was a prophet and a judge. He anointed both Saul and David as kings of Israel. Uh, Elisha, who just got anointed there, he anoints Jehu uh, as king over Israel and you could read that in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 1 and 3. He takes a whole box of oil and dumps it on his head. He says, grab me the box of oil, and he takes that box and he pours it over Jehu's head. Go and practice that one. See how far that, I mean, you know, take a whole thing of oil and dump it on somebody. You know, that's, that's in the Old Testament. This anointing was a physical anointing with physical oil for a physical position over a physical nation by a physical prophet or priest, okay? Physical, physical, physical. Bear in mind, there was not one woman that was ever anointed or one woman that ever anointed uh, somebody else. So next time, now, who, who does this stuff? You say, well, you, you know, who, the Charismatics, Pentecostals, they will, and, and if a woman comes at you with a bottle of oil, be nice, kindly say, by what authority are you doing this? Show me a Bible verse where, a woman actually anointed. Show me a Bible. They don't got none. So, and, and that's, that's who tends to get kind of carried away with this type of stuff. Now, what else did this anointing oil signify in the Old Testament? Well, 1 Samuel 16. 
Look at 1 Samuel 16. This is pretty. This one's a pretty serious one. I mean, it's it's uh, something happened. Something happened when this anointing, this oil, was upon somebody. All right. Look at 1 Samuel 16. Look at verse 13. That's page number 445. 445. 1 Samuel 16. 13. This was, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So if somebody comes up and says, look, you, you want the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to take this oil. I'm going to put it on you. This, you know, you're expecting, oh, I, I'm going to get the Holy Spirit of God because this Christian came up to me and said, I'm going to anoint you with oil. You're going to get the Holy Spirit. You're, you're taking a verse and you're not applying it correctly. You're not, you're handling the word of God deceitfully, as, as Paul would say. But this happened. The anointed with oil, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Okay? So, What's the deal with these anointings is they could come and go. Uh, you learn about in the, Old, in the Old Testament, the Spirit, who Saul was anointed. He was anointed. And there was a verse that, that, that says uh, in 1 Samuel eleven six, 6, Saul was filled with the Spirit of God. Okay, then what happened? You keep reading the story. By the end of the story, God, the Spirit of God left him, never came back to him. So this is not the case of you today. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 9. Romans chapter 8. I'll give you a real quick New Testament verse. Romans chapter 8, verse number 9. Very good verse. Romans 8, 9. It says this. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God 